Hi, Louise. Thank you very much for coming along and talking to me today. So um, we're continuing on with the conversations uh, with women in STEM as part of the International Women's Day for 2022. And um, so we're just going to have a week chat about, um, about you, Louise, and your career and the kind of research that you're doing and uh, any words of wisdom that you have for any aspiring women in STEM. So uh, we have Dr. Louise Craigting. She is a senior lecturer in Queen's University in Belfast, working in the um, School of Natural and Built Environment. And Louise works at the interface between marine engineering and uh, marine biology and renewable energy. So Louise, I think at the minute you're working on environmental interactions of um, marine renewable energy devices. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the kind of research that you're doing at the moment? Yeah, no, thanks, Karen, for inviting me to have this talk. And it's uh, it's good to be able to discuss this and especially, you know, inspire other people to go into our field. Um, so I've been talk working on so renewable energy. So that's marine and tidal, uh, wave and tidal devices. So they are generating electricity. Um, if essentially, to we want to get more of them into the environment to, um, to produce electricity for us in a sustainable manner. But obviously, we need to you know, always look at what the environmental interaction is of these big devices with the environment. So we're looking at things like you know, the, um, the, the risk or the collision risk of the devices with animals. So like looking at how seals and uh, um, porpoise, harbour porpoises and, and whales, et cetera, will navigate around these devices. We look at things like the underwater noise, how much noise is a device actually putting out? How is this interfering with um, marine organisms? Uh, looking at how water motion itself, so the, the, the point is that these big devices are extracting energy, but when you're extracting energy, you're actually also reducing the water motion around it. You're changing the height, what they call the hydrodynamic environment. You you're changing the water environment, how the currents flow around the devices. And we need to understand how that may have an implication for uh, different organisms. Things as small as the little plants in the sea and the little um, animals, so the zooplankton, phytoplankton, right up to the larger, you know, higher trophic levels of fish, then see, you know, the mammals and, and dolphins, etc. So great research. I'm completely biased for this. Um, is that is that always what you wanted to work on then, Louise? Kind of how has your career developed then over the years to, to work in this field? So, so interestingly, I'm actually uh, what they call an ecophysiologist, which worked on seaweed. So my first passion has always been seaweeds and um, it's looking at the growth rates of seaweeds and how the environment influences the growth rate of seaweeds. And the big one was always hydrodynamics or the, the water motion around seaweeds. We didn't really know a lot about it. And it's more looking at, you know, very small molecular processes around seaweeds and how that interacts with things like uptake of nutrients and also things like photosynthesis because seaweeds are very important. They're, they're, the, they're basically the land plants, but in the water and they are um, obviously photosynthesizing their you know, uptake of carbon. So they're quite important. But it's because of that, inter you know, because of that um, knowledge about water motion and its sort of influence on biological processes that I sort of got into the renewable energy. So I've also worked with uh, actually a lot of different, uh, well, sea urchins, so they're broadcast spawners. We're looking at how fertilization is influenced by water motion, and that's the let, natural progression sort of led into the environmental interactions, changes in water motion around the devices, and how do we, how does that influence many different biological processes? So I've gone seaweeds, a bit, uh, you know, invertebrates, and then now, you know, uh, mammals as well. So it's, it's a very varied area that I've sort of covered in the past years since my PhD so. Brilliant. Um, so what kind of skills and qualifications then would you say would be particularly useful in your job? The actual skills required, I mean whilst we don't really like it but maths statistics is actually probably one of the biggest ones to to get your to get a really good understanding of um, and just having actually you know science in general it, it, there's my, my field is very different. There's, you know, I've had to learn a lot of things with the physics um, and also the, the maths and, and, and statistics. Um, but just having like a, a general understanding of a lot of different um, areas. I mean, it, for me, it hasn't been just one area that I've focused on. It's more, it's been in quite a number of different areas and I'm still learning uh, each day. 
uh, each you know week I come across things that I have to go back and read and learn about it's a constant learning process so I can't you know there's a good foundation when you, you leave school when you go to university you get a good you know really good understanding but as you carry on in the field and, and the only way to progress and advance in our field is actually to carry on learning yeah I'm still looking at um, and refreshing my memory about you know even sampling design uh, because we over the years you, you're changing and, and each time you do another experiment you have to or you're planning another study you have to think about how do you analyze it how do you um, um, write up about it but then you have to always you know go back to the literature learn new to, uh, to read up what's happening at the moment and keep at the forefront of the science but that's that's learning you have to continually learn but that's great so you could start out with um you mentioned a university degree there you could start out with doing like a marine biology degree or an environmental science or an engineering degree and then just like you've done you can kind of go ahead and specialize in different areas depending on where your interests take you over the years but so long as you're always open to learning it's always good exactly because, I mean, realistically, my undergraduate degree was botany. So I, land plants, had nothing to do with, um, you know, my master's was on uh, black coral, so corals. Um, and then I also did sea urchins and, yeah, seaweeds. Uh, so that's what I mean. It's very varied, but it, it just depends what you're interested in and where you go. But there will be underlying fundamental subjects. So a general you know, a good knowledge, you know, all rounder of, of, of chemistry is actually important. Physics for me is important. Uh, and, and statistics, uh, maths is, is actually really important. And especially for engineering, you know, maths is actually crucial. So brilliant. Um, so as well as being open to kind of learning all these new things all the time, what would you say are the best aspects of your job and the most challenging aspects of it as well? Well, if, if we're talking about research, the research is, is the best aspect. I mean, I love, I love the research. I love working with uh, the different colleagues that I work with. So I work with a very broad range of people. Um, and it's not just science people. I work with a lot of uh, ind industry people as well. Um, and the nice thing is there's a really broad range of, of um, different groups that you work with as well, when, especially with industry. Not everybody is obviously from a science background. They're coming from a different um, background as well, uh, you know, they're more of an industry perhaps, or, you know, management, etc. cetera. Um, but no research and, and working, you know, with my PhD students, I, I love that. Um, and you, the, the most challenging, I think, um, whilst, you know, the, the teaching aspect is probably not, not that that's challenging, but it's the, it's, and, and finding new ways to engage and ensure that people you know keep up to date with um what we're we're trying to get across to them so mm -hmm. um always like before the lectures you know finding putting things into context as well and like finding news articles for example just to keep it more relevant as well because a lot of the stuff is you know you need to ensure that it's relevant for what people are learning in this day and age so mm -hmm. yeah keeping up to date with everything <laughs> Um, so obviously it's not always completely straightforward. Um, I've done my time in academia and um, with, with everything, no matter what field you go to, you'll be applying for things, things might not work out, you'll start doing something, something will go wrong. Um, and everyone has these challenges and these kind of setbacks and things. Um, and a big aspect of being able to move forward in your career and develop is finding ways to be able to cope with them and not take it all completely personal, um, but be able to kind of learn from them as well. So what way do you find then that you tend to cope with setbacks and what have you found has been useful over the years? Um, I think, yeah, that, that's a, the, a very good question and it can be of all different nature um, setbacks. So when we try to publish a paper and it gets, you know, review and it gets rejected you know that that's one thing that we've always had to to learn to deal with but the thing is you just look at what somebody has said and you have to throw it in a different light it's not you not doing something correctly it may be just that your way of portraying it to somebody was not how they interpreted it so you need to look at the comments and just change maybe how you um you know focus the paper for example and 
you know, we always can get something wrong. It's not, you know, I don't think anybody ever gets anything right. But I mean, it's just a matter of looking at what another example would be, we do a lot of proposals we have to um, submit. And of course, not a lot of them get funded. It's, it's a very, um, you know, competitive world that we're living in. But we look at the comments and then you look and you think, well, how can I change this to make it more, you know, um, stand out for the next time? So it's never, it's just basically taking criticism. If we, if we took on criticism personally, then you might as well not, you know, that, that, you know, I wouldn't be here in my job. Basically, each day there's something new that comes or it doesn't work or it's, you know, but that's the whole beauty of science. It's finding a different way of getting your point across, basically. And it's a different way of, you know, finding solutions. I mean, that's what science is all about, finding solutions. Um, but don't, don't ever take it to heart, personally, because there's always going to be critics out there. And I think science, we do get criticised. We, we have to deal with that. But I look at it more as, OK, that person didn't quite understand what we were trying to say. Obviously, I, I potentially have wrote, written it in a way that wasn't very clear, so I need to change that. And that's as simple as that, you know, and it could just be as simple as changing the way you've written something. Just because you've understood it doesn't mean somebody else mm -hmm. has. So um, it's, just a, it's just reflection as well, just always reflecting how to, to alter something. But finding solutions, science, it's the enjoyment. What it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so any words of wisdom then for young people, and um, given that it's International Women's Day, particularly for um, girls and women who are thinking of entering STEM subjects? Any words of wisdom or pearls of advice? If you have a passion for something, go for it. That's that's what I've always found. I've got a, a, a I've always had a passion for the marine environment, and I've never seen something as um, there's hurdles. I just you know go out there and do it. Um, that's that's basically what I can say to somebody so anybody out there uh yeah just just go and if you've really got a passion just go and do it and nothing will ever you know there could be problems but I don't see them as problems they're just things we need to solve overcome and carry on so brilliant super and last question um so this year's theme for International Women's Day is uh, break the bias and obviously in STEM subjects, it's something that's been in the news and kind of been um, an issue for a long time and um, being able to kind of make it more open and inclusive and um, not just for, for women, it's not just a gender issue. Um, so where do you see the opportunities to break the bias then in your field of research? Well, I guess that's the, the sort of interesting part. Um, yes, it's in, in a gender way, there is, predominantly, I guess, more, um, you know, males than females. But I've worked with some really uh, different, like, different developers that have actually had, like, um, the, the females have actually had really, you know, quite high up roles in the, in the company. So I've actually been quite lucky. The, the best advice is just that there is, should be no barriers. We, we, we can all do it. Um, and it's just a matter of your enthusiasm to get where you want to go and that you can reach you can do anything you want if you if you've put the work into it and I have certainly not been sitting and not doing much uh, I do work hard to get where I am um, but also because I'm so uh, you know passionate about it so and I like to see people all around me also achieving those same goals um, if, where they want to where they want to end up going so Okay. Always there to support. support. That's the key. All right. Well, thank you very much, Louise, and um, good luck with all your research. And uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on it. Thank you.